Welcome to the Next Gen Podcast, where we explore the next generation's perspective on the future of business. This podcast is powered by Commercial Sync. You can learn more about integrating your ERP and CRM today at Commercial.com. So, hi everyone. I'm Victoria Jenkins. I'm the content specialist here at Commercial, and I'm also one of the youngest members of Commercial. And Noah. And I'm Noah Thomas. I am the head of marketing and partnerships here at Commercial, and I'm part of the millennial generation. And so today we're joined by Shannon J. Gregg, PhD and MBA. So Shannon is the president of Cloud Adoption Solutions, a sales process and um, Salesforce consulting practice. And Noah and I have been working through her popular book, which is called It's About Time, which is available now. We'll have links to that in the show notes to the Amazon page. Um, and so her book is being used by sales teams across the country to refocus on what's important to drive revenue and results. And Shannon is also instructs the professional selling course at Point Park University, and she's been a Salesforce speaker at multiple events. And uh, notably, what stood out to me is that you're named the analytics um, by Analytics Insight, the one of the ten most influential women in technology in 2020, which I thought was very amazing. Congrats! Thank you. Is there anything else that I missed on that long list? I don't think so. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah, happy to have you here today. So, I mean, jumping right into it, Noah and I both saw that your doctoral thesis was titled How Diffusion of Innovations, Change Management, and Adult Learner User Adoption Theories Impact Customer Relationship Management, Adoption, and Usage in Nonprofit Organizations. So, very, very specific, for sure. Um, so, I mean, the first question that stood out to me was what prompted you to specifically look at nonprofit organizations? One of the things that I found when working with nonprofit organizations on their CRM systems is that they didn't have the same commercial approach as for-profit institutions. And so I really became interested in looking at how they could use CRM more efficiently and more effectively using that sort of commercialized approach since CRM is really an enterprise software. And so I started really digging into that. And that's when I thought, you know what, I think this would make a really good dissertation topic. And it did. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. So starting off, I mean, what was one of the, what, what do you think is the nonprofit's apprehension to taking a more commercialized approach? Is it simply they're lacking in the skills that you would typically learn in like a business school, for example? I think that could be part of it. But I think um, another big part of it is in a nonprofit organization, most people wear multiple hats truly, where in commercial organizations, if you're in marketing, you're generally in marketing. If you're in, if you're in sales, you're generally in sales. But in nonprofit, everybody's focused on the donors and the mission. So if it means everybody has to focus on something over in operations or everybody has to focus on something that's happening that is mission related, everyone runs towards it. And so that swim lane is a little bit wider for nonprofits than it is in a commercial organization. Okay, interesting. So in that um, the thesis title, you mentioned that there are some impacts um, specifically through like diffusion innovations, change management, and adult learner user adoption theories. So could you maybe expand on a couple of those? <laughs> sure. So with change management, this one applies both to nonprofits and for-profit uh, organizations. A lot of people, by the time they roll out a change, the people who are on the change committee have been thinking about it, planning for it, getting ready to roll it out for so long that they forget the minute that they tell the rest of the organization about it, they're starting at ground zero. And so one of the most important things about the change management theories is that concept of quick wins, which is if you're doing a new implementation or you're doing an installation or some sort of add-on, start small, gain people's trust, and then keep building on that. And that really was what flew into that diffusion of innovations theory, which is how do you take an innovation or an idea or a concept and diffuse it across an organization so that people will accept it? Yeah. And um, so just to back up a little bit, I think you and I met in maybe the most 2020-esque way possible. Uh, so we were both going to the, uh, I think it was Partner Force Conference. That's right. Uh, uh, it was online uh, this year. Uh, well, 
in 2020 because of COVID, of course. Um, and you had put into chat, hey, I just got my PhD and, you know, and you had posted uh, a little bit about your thesis. And I think just shortly after that, you and I had connected on LinkedIn and I had said, hey, do you want to jump on a podcast? Um, so in very little time meeting each other, uh, we, we got to talking about something that I feel like a lot of us uh, get connected on, which is uh, CRM user adoption, right? Uh, so, you know, our company being an app exchange partner, we hear a lot about this. Um, because we get in really early, what would be one thing that you say, um, maybe either in your in your thesis or just something that you found over years of consulting, uh, that really helps organizations drive their user adoption? Such a heavy and loaded question, Noah. And, <laughs> and you're right. I think you know when we're thinking about how adoption spreads, it, it starts with acceptance, right? So the user acceptance is at the very basic part of adoption. And so I think a lot of times when people are saying, we've got this new technology and we're so hyped up on it, it's going to change your life for the better, we forget to gain their acceptance first, which is a really simple sort of problem statement that says, here's the problem that you have. Do you agree you have that problem? Here's something that we think will solve it. Do you agree this will solve the problem? And then moving into your traditional stages of communication, go live, you know, that sort of thing. And I think a lot of times what really happens is people forget who's on the receiving end of this technology are humans and humans are quirky and humans are change resistant. That's so true. Yeah. I, I can't think of how many times where even as an admin, right, rolling out a new change and thinking, oh, this is great. And then the first thing I hear back is, hey, why'd you do this? <laughs> so, uh, you know, in, in speaking about that, too, yeah, as a solo admin, so we, we primarily work with small businesses. And uh, from the sounds of it, you work with small non-for-profits and some larger non-for-profits as well. What would you say is different uh, in a small organization versus a large organization when it comes to user adoption? What's interesting about small organizations is small organizations have the agility to be able to adopt something as a group and have that impact their culture so much more quickly than large organizations, where in large organizations, you may see entire departments that say, okay, we're into this. You know, you know who's always into this? Customer success. They're into anything that can help them sort of truncate the way that they delight their customers, where sales may say, hang on a second, you're getting in the way of me generating revenue. But the smaller organizations, that agility is something that can really be helpful when you're looking at user acceptance and user adoption. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. And you, sorry, I'll, oh, I'll, no, let, you, I'll let you go, yeah. Victoria, you're good. <laughs> okay, yeah, I was going to say, um, are there any ways for these larger, or for these smaller organizations, like the strategies that they use for these quick adoption things to go through well? Is there any way that large um, businesses could ever do something similar? Is it simply part of their nature? Phenomenal question, Victoria. I think what it comes down to is this idea, which in the dissertation topic the title that you stated, which is very long and specific, is that adult learner theory piece. And small organizations can very easily say, I know Noah's a visual learner. He likes to see things written on PowerPoints and then it sinks in. Victoria's kinesthetic. She likes to do things. So in small organizations, they know their people so well they know how to roll out educational programming. We're in larger organizations. They're trying for this one size fits all approach. And so one of the things that larger organizations can do to really push acceptance and adoption is to say, let's tickle all of these types of learners. You know, so maybe you put out an SOP document, maybe you put out a video, and maybe you have office hours where people can come to you with questions where they put their learning into hands-on application. Okay. Yeah, I agree. That even reminds me of a discussion that we had on a different podcast episode, which I'll also link below with, um, I think it was Michelle Hansen. We talked about having different sort of forms of, um, if you're going to an executive for a meeting or something, bringing in both a PowerPoint, maybe a video, having a visual, lots of different forms of learning. Yeah, I agree. That's a big thing that large businesses don't do. Um, and so I think another interesting place that that could apply is perhaps in, for example, thinking of specifically Salesforce, the health guides, I find that often they're just written now or there's maybe no video health or such. Like that's definitely an area that they could expand to assist other smaller and larger businesses alike with adoption. It's so, it's so true. And I think, you know, when Noah talked about us, 
meeting cute online, <laughs> a lot of people are turning to YouTube because they don't want to necessarily call the plumber because they don't want strangers in their house right now. So they're going to YouTube and saying, how do I fix my furnace? <laughs> so I think we have to imagine that a lot of the people that work for us, they want to be able to do that same sort of thing. And so I think giving somebody that sort of step-by-step -step video where they can pause, do the three things you said is really ideal for a lot of people, especially now in the generation that is used to having videos showing them what to do. Yeah, definitely. That's uh, that's that's the one thing that I that I notice a lot with successful consulting projects. They all center around video content. Uh, it's it's a, definitely a key thread there. And you know, capitalizing on times changing uh, and user adoption. I think the book that you wrote, it's about time, which again we'll link below in the description. Um, is also dedicated to you know, project management and productivity, which I think ties in perfectly with user adoption. Uh, in the COVID era, how do you feel software and working from home, evolving expectations and, and employees uh, changing their views that you might have written in the book? Do you think it rings more true now than ever? Uh, do you think that the, the times have kind of adjusted those things? I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. That is Amazing question, Noah, and I think one of the things that uh, this new sort of work from home era is going to rely on, even more importantly, is the chapter that we wrote about flexing your no muscle. And so I think now that we no longer have work-life balance, that's a lie. <laughs> you know, we live at work now. Yeah. Work is <laughs> the same place where we eat and sleep. And so I think one of the things that we have to be really cognizant about is setting boundaries for ourselves and for our other team members. So if you say, you know, between the hours of 6 and 8 p.m., that's when I do my dinner, that's when I decompress. If you need something, I'll jump back on, you know, between 9 and 10 p.m., but these are the hours that I am setting boundaries. And so, you know, our, our friends and colleagues in Europe, they do this really well. They have been doing this really well. So I think their transition to working from home has probably been a little bit better than ours in America, where it's like, from the minute you get up until the minute you go to sleep, you are on call because your laptop is open in your bedroom or your living room or wherever you're sitting. Yeah, definitely. The the workaholic American culture uh, rings true now more than ever, right? Uh, so and we talk about that a lot when we onboard employees. Um, one of the things that Commercial does is we have a, you know employees in about 30 different countries. So uh, we talk a lot about when when it's time to clock out. Right. Um, because you don't think when you get to a corporate job, you know, oh, hey, there's an end point. It's more like, oh, I'm paying, you know, I'm getting paid a salary. I need to show up. I need to get this job done. Um, how do you uh, how do you kind of weigh that with productivity um, for those that maybe aren't used to that work life balance? There have been commercial studies done, and, and I believe probably in the next three years, we'll see some academic studies done on productivity during the pandemic. But right now, these sort of early returns coming out of the commercial studies are showing productivity jumped during the pandemic. People aren't spending time do, doing their commute on trains or in cars, so they're willing to give that commute time back to their company. I think people are now finding that they have to say, how do I compartmentalize my day? You know, when do I do my laundry? When do I do my grocery shopping? And so I think productivity will find has really gained with people from working from home. And so I don't think, you know, productivity has struggled at all during the pandemic, which has been a really interesting byproduct. Yeah, very strange. I wonder if it's even just a method of trying to, you know, block out what's going on in the world. And, you know, I definitely do it myself. Um, but so what are some ways that companies um, even in small businesses, could encourage creating these um, separations between work and life while at home. I think companies have done a really good job of saying, how do we keep our team connected? So you see a lot of these virtual happy hours and virtual escape rooms where they're saying, you know, we need some time to decompress and do that sort of, you know, water cooler talk that you would have done in the office setting. But I think one of the things that companies can do a better job at is saying from the top down, you're allowed to take PTO days, even if you don't go anywhere, right? You might still be reluctant to jump on a plane, but take the time off, take a mental health break, go walk around, you know, please eat your dinner. Don't, don't respond to me. And a lot of that really comes from the tone and tenor that's set from the top, doesn't it? 
Yeah, absolutely. Mental health days are so important, and especially in this time, just getting outside and just walking outside, just taking that break. Um, I was also curious to ask you uh, the question. I think uh, you know has probably been tirelessly fought out on Twitter at this point. But uh, what's your opinion of productivity and going back to the office at some point in a post-COVID world? Do you think that um, maybe? This is the time where work's finally changed to a point where there's going to be split, you know, home office days as an independent per company. What's kind of your view on that? I live right on the commuter train. The commuter train is my backyard. Mm -hmm. And so I've been watching people at the station just start to gradually increase. So week over week, there are more people that are definitely going downtown. And I think there are a lot of people that need that break. They want to go into the office. They want to have that sort of camaraderie that comes from being in a space together and standing in front of a whiteboard. But I do think there is this really positive gain where we've been able to reattract people to the workforce who um, maybe would have been, you know, caretakers who had to stay home with a child or an elderly person who now can say, hey, guess what? I can sort of manage these two things at once. So there's this whole new workforce we can capitalize on by being a little bit more flexible about when and where people need to come into the office. So I think this new sort of hybrid or as you know, universities call it high flex life is going to give us the best of everything. And I'm truly looking forward to us embracing that. Yeah, it's almost like the freelance uh, marketplace has finally come full circle, you know? Uh, Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to let Victoria take the next question. Yeah. (laughs) Been talking too long. (laughs) Yeah, it's okay. Um, So moving on to one interesting thing that stands out to me that I mentioned before is Salesforce's learning system. So, of course, there's Trailhead and they have extensive help resources. Um, Again, I honestly have never found them super useful, not typically would go to YouTube. Um, So although these are all in place to assist their users in learning how to use their CRM, specifically Salesforce system, um, there's still a market for products such as yours, cloud adoption solutions um, that also teach people how to use their CRM. So I would say, first of all, how do these products um, initially set themselves apart from Salesforce's um, own learning products? Yeah, you know, one of the things that the organizations that we work with, which are are a lot of sort of small and mid-market size companies, is when they look at Trailhead, they feel it's very admin focused, right? So when a playground pops up, a lot of the people that we're dealing with are frightened by that. They don't want to get inside of there. They don't want to know that. They want to say, how do I manage my sales or my development team? How do I use Salesforce, you know, to have my Monday morning sort of review meetings to say, what's going on? What did you do last week? What are we going to do this week? And so I think that business user is addressed in Trailhead, but a lot of the people who are a little bit uh, newer to Salesforce or who are newer to their positions, they don't know how to exploit Trailhead to teach them what they need to know. So some of it is just holding hands and guiding them through Trailhead and saying, here are some modules you should take that will be really helpful. And then I think the other side of it, Victoria, is that art of the possible. How do you let them know what's even possible in Salesforce? So you may have you know, newer sales managers or people who are new to Salesforce who don't know that you can do approval automation, by the way, or you can, don't know that they can set up um, list views. There are some things that are like pretty common to people who are very experienced in Salesforce, but these smaller, newer organizations just don't know it. So they don't even know where to start in Trailhead. So a lot of what we do is say, we're going to give you a tour. We're going to show you how to do the things, you know, in a sort of one-on-one delivery so that you know how to find these things. It's that whole concept of teaching a man to fish. So, you know, if you're not very technologically advanced and if you're not from the technology generation, because for the first time, we've got four generations in the workforce all at once. So if you're older and you used to run your sales team on post-it notes that you had spread across your office, here's how you can use that same sort of concept in Salesforce. Yeah, that, that's a great question. And going back to, uh, you know, not wanting to call the plumber to invite them into your house, when is it time to call a Salesforce expert like yourself? Like when, when do you see that moment where you go, ah, you know, pull the help lover, call me. And <laughs> where, where do you typically see that in a small and medium sized business? I think a lot of times if it's something that that, that company is going to do one time, 
If it's something they're only going to do once. And for them to do that, they'll have to spend 20 hours on YouTube and Trailhead trying to figure out a one-time thing. That's a great time to call a consultant, right? If it's something that you're going to do over and over and over again, you know, if it's opportunity creation, you better figure that out (laughs) because you're going to do that a lot. Um, So I think, I think it's measuring that sort of risk versus reward. How much, how much time do I put into this and what's my time worth versus calling somebody else who can come in and do it for me and show me sort of the end result or how I interact with that as a user. All right. And now I have a, I have kind of a tricky question for you. So as someone that's used Salesforce for five years, what is your number one productivity tip for Salesforce users? Oh, I am obsessed with list views. And I think <laughs> when I meet people and they don't use list views, I'm like, we got it. It's time to come to Jesus. We have to talk about list views um, <laughs> because I, I can, re- I've been using Salesforce for a really long time. And I remember when list views weren't really a thing that people used or understood and definitely weren't easy to set up. I mean, when you were living in classic, um, it wasn't as easy to say, show me this thing with these parameters. But now if I'm curious to say, show me everybody whose name is Noah, who lives in California, I can quickly do that and use that as an actionable sort of way to message all of those people with something that's in common or a way that I can query that data really rapidly to say, I want to know how many times this particular thing has happened with these particular fields. Absolutely. And what would you say your tips vary from a non-for-profit organization versus somebody that's a for-profit organization driving sales? You know, non-for-profits are always, of course, driving sales in a different way through don't, you know, donations. But um, what would you say the, the primary productivity tip that you would give one versus the other? So I think for everybody, I would give the same tip, which is look for ways to increase your automation because you can increase output and you can increase productivity by reducing the number of things people do over and over and over again. There's no value in Victoria copying and pasting something all of the time from a document into an email. You can set up an automation for that. There's no sense in Noah saying, oh, now I have to set up a follow-up task once I have moved an opportunity into this stage. You can set up an automation for that. And so for all of these organizations, I say, look for ways to automate the things that you do repetitively. Okay. One thing that kind of stands out to me in this overall discussion is just the immense list of options and things that you can do with Salesforce. And that is both a great thing, but I wonder if it also leads to perhaps like an eventual downfall of Salesforce in which companies just decide maybe it's just too complicated. Like does the the need for even companies such as cloud adoption solutions and these people to set out and teach you Salesforce show that it's just too complex for the average user to use? Here, Victoria, is the sort of crux of what inspired my research where you've got loads of small nonprofits who look at Salesforce and say, oh, cool, I can get 10 licenses for free. And they get 10 licenses for a very complex product. And so one of the things that I try to encourage these smaller nonprofits to do is do not be seduced by the amount of customization you can do or the videos that you can see. Let's try to keep this implementation or installation or integration, whatever you're trying to do, simple. Keep it simple because people have a tendency in these organizations to open up Salesforce and say, whoa, I can do all of the things, but you shouldn't do all of the things at once. So starting with that quick wins concept is a good way to keep yourself from feeling so overwhelmed by the capabilities and the flexibilities of the system and giving yourself permission to say, sure, maybe I'm only using 4% of what the system can do, but that's okay because this 4% is 100% for my company. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then uh, just on a totally unrelated topic note, um, one of the things that we see a lot of times, especially with small, medium-sized businesses, is um, power admin leaves, right? And then productivity and user adoption just goes right off a cliff. Um, What would be your recommendation to companies not necessarily losing admins, but uh, to kind of curb that from happening, right? 
Yes, this is a huge problem now, especially because we see the ecosystem growing so much that talent is at a premium. And so for me, it always is rooted in executive adoption. So you've got executives who are not the biggest cheerleaders of the product because they're only receiving outputs, right? They're getting the dashboards. Maybe they're getting them emailed to them so they don't even know their login to Salesforce. And so I would encourage companies, one, if you are that power admin, Find your executive sponsor who's going to spread the love, you know, to the other executives to say, this is why Salesforce is a cornerstone of what we're doing in our business process. And I think executives need to look at that power admin and say, what are the five things you know about Salesforce that I don't, that I should know right now in terms of capabilities? And so that is, I think, the number one thing that companies should do is not allow their executives to say, I just receive outputs from Salesforce. I don't need to know what goes on inside of that. Yeah, definitely. And we see a lot of organizations that that pick up the automation and the change adoption and some of the newer things that Salesforce releases like Einstein Analytics, which is now Tableau CRM, but like we we see the 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 innovators and kind of the leaders in that space being driven by executives, not necessarily by admins, but by executives. So, I think that's that's absolutely you hit the nail on the head on that one. Um and then you know what? What would you say besides Trailhead and uh, you know Googling help articles uh, is the number one kind of help source that that users can go to, to for self help um, for to look for help for Salesforce specifically. I think, Noah, we used to look at these live events, right? You would go to yep. your sort of local um, Salesforce tour and they would show you something and you would say, oh, that's amazing. And then you'd be able to ask the person sitting next to you, how do you do that? And so what I would encourage people to do is do exactly what you and I did, which is interact on the chat whenever there is an online event. So Salesforce community events are still happening and it's great now that they're not geographically bound because I can attend one in Phoenix, one in Toronto, and I can even go to one in India all in the same week without leaving my home office. So I would say get involved in the community in the way that feels comfortable to you. Attend these virtual community events. Um, Salesforce Twitter is a big thing. There's a lot of people on Twitter and Salesforce who are very happy to help you. And then, of course, I think just sort of finding somebody that that their style resonates with you. So if you follow somebody, sign up for their newsletter, right? Because there are so many good ones out there where people are giving tips that are appropriate for you and your role and where you're at in your Salesforce journey right now. Yeah. And I'll add one um, because I know Shannon won't self-promote, but look for good speakers like Shannon that are speaking about topics that you care about and that you want to look for, right? Uh, so I think with those world events, you know, especially looking for good speakers, um, those those things can be like the difference maker, just hearing somebody say something that resonates with you and then all of a sudden, oh yeah, I need to go do <laughs> blank. It might not be anything earth shattering, but uh, it might totally change the the way that user adoption gets driven in your company. So yeah. Okay, and one more question, kind of jumping off of it. Um, so we've talked about, you know, Salesforce overall and learning how to use the system. How can Gen Z and millennials alike, people newer to the workforce, sort of capitalize on their on the ability to learn the system at home for relatively free or low cost? Definitely. I think one of the things that is uh, fun and interesting is that there are a lot of trailhead modules that are made for mobile. And I think those ones are a great place to start. So, you know, if you happen to be just waiting six minutes for your pasta to boil, great time to look at your phone and take on a new trailhead module. And I think um, we've seen some really cool stuff, some really cool partnerships going on with um, nonprofit organizations like you know, moms who code or pie tap who are welcoming people in and saying, we're going to help you figure this out. And it's at no cost to you. And so if you're a self learner, if you love digging through problems yourself, spend the time on your own digging through trailhead. But if not, find one of these organizations that has a sort of affinity towards what you're doing. Um, and, And we see it now with organizations like girls who code who are bringing in, you know, people as young as 12 years old to say, let me expose you to what Trailhead can do for you. And that is thrilling, really thrilling. Yeah, absolutely. And so are we even seeing perhaps some of these small businesses and even large businesses alike um, 
saying if you're applying for a job and you're a younger person and they see these things, like your ability to use Salesforce is not instantly a Immediately. It, yeah. it, it really is immediately. I'm involved with a program at Salesforce through their Talent Alliance. It's a university program for people who are teaching um, courses at universities that incorporate Salesforce. So the, the class that I teach at Point Park incorporates Salesforce. And so I'm seeing these really cool things go on at university levels where they're saying, we're going to teach you what it means to be an admin or a developer or a technical architect. You know, um, in my course, we really talk about how to be a salesperson and use Salesforce. And so I think we're starting to see that push down where now these students are going to come out of university uniquely qualified because if you already know Salesforce, you can sort of truncate your onboarding to a company by probably 20% because you already understand the philosophy of that. So where other people are going to have to sit through training for that, you can get out there and tend to your territory. <laughs> you know, I mean, that gives you a true advantage, I think. Yeah, definitely. A big time. Um, so going back to your book a little bit, I do have a, another question that I'd written down here that I had totally forgotten about. Um, one of my favorite uh, chapters that you had written was a chapter that you had written on productivity and its role in creativity, right? And how productivity can really inspire creativity. And as somebody who started their career as a marketer uh, and considers myself fairly creative, how do you see the two relating to each other? And can you just talk to us a, like a little bit about that? Sure. Well, I think one of the, the sort of ideas that Google put out, which was a really good one that a lot of technology firms have adopted and many more need to, is that creativity can be scheduled. You can schedule time for creativity. So a lot of people think of creativity as these lightning strike inspirations, like you're in the shower and you have the best idea ever. But if you can schedule yourself time you know, to say, okay, on Wednesdays between one and three, this is when I read articles. This is when I think deeply. This is when I scratch things on the backs of napkins and giving yourself that sort of open headspace to, you know, create in a way that is, you know, meditative, but also scheduled that can happen. So you don't have to just wait for creativity or inspiration to strike you. But if you can schedule that time and say, I'm still productive because on Wednesday mornings, you know, between nine and 10, I make my prospecting calls, you know, 10 and 11, we have a standing staff meeting, but between one and three, that's my sacred time. And that's when I schedule time to be creative. And that can be creative about saying, how do we truncate some of our processes? What can we automate? What are the things that we can do to be more productive? That is a great way to sort of approach tying those two things together, productivity and creativity. Absolutely. Yeah, well said. I think, you know, in, in this world of COVID where we're talking about scheduling, you know, time away from the computer and when you're not there too, uh, it really helps to be organized and, and productivity can really uh, drive that, you know, being intentional with time, right? Um, which is something that I've, I've really taken away from that book. If you haven't already, uh, I really recommend picking up Shannon's book. It's about time. Uh, Shannon, thank you so much for coming on today. I really appreciate the time uh, and uh, fantastic having you on as a guest. Um, I hope all of our listeners uh, will go visit the links in, below in the podcast episode here. Uh, but I want to make sure we give you some time too to plug anything that you want. Uh, so I'll, I'll hand it over to you. Well, thanks for having me. This has been really enjoyable for me to talk to you both and talk to your whole audience. Um, I've got a couple things coming up that will be really fun. I'll be speaking at SenCal Dreamin in June, at Tahoe Dreamin in October. And um, I have, I'm working on a new book coming out about revenue operations, how to build a revenue operations team, which, as you know, is tied to productivity. So <laughs> super excited about those things. Excellent. And people can also find you on Twitter at Shannon J. Gregg. That's with two G's and we'll link that below as well. Um, and we'll also link your LinkedIn and your personal site, your personal site as well. Um, of course, we need to mention that these episodes are sponsored by Commercial Sync. Uh, what it does is it links together ERP and CRM. If you're speaking to a salesperson at Commercial, you can let them know that you got promo code podcast nine. And I, as always, thank you for listening to the Next Gen Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe on Apple, Spotify, Anchor, wherever you get your podcasts, that you never miss an episode. And you can always find more Next Gen content on all of the Commercial social channels at Commercial or at Commercial underscore sync on Instagram. Links to those are in the show notes. 
and you can find full length videos with full length videos with audio as well, of course, on the YouTube channel for Commercian, which is also at Commercian. Thanks, Shannon, for being here. Thanks for having me.